something rather sort of uh, naughties about it, and now we've got into the teens as it's dying. Of course, that's nonsense too. So placing me number one on that list is clearly rubbish. But, but nevertheless, I, I'm pleased to be on the list, and uh, that was very gratifying. I, I think it was. It was. It really is. Uh, it says something's happening. I think. Uh, you know, one of the things. And, and at the end of the movie, I, I think with, there was some discussion about that the quote from Bill Pullman. And I really wanted that at the end because I think that there's often the question is, are we making, are we doing anything? Are we just bashing each other's brains out? And it's, it's a question where I, I ask myself all the time uh, when I'm getting up early to go on a plane to do some of this stuff, um, is, it, is it making an impact? And I think, I think things like that suggest to me at least that, it, that, that it's worth it. Yes, I agree with that. And, and in a way that was a sort of negative ending to the film. And that's one way of doing it. I think it probably was the right way of doing it. Um, but it, one could make a case for having a more positive ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, what if, if that leads to actually to the next, perfectly the next question. What, do you, what I know we've talked about this, but what do you hope will happen? What, what, that this film will do? What, what will happen after this film? What do you, what do you hope? Not just on the way out, when they go to the pub afterwards, and when they go to have dinner, they'll just be the conversation will go on. This film will uh, stimulate people to talk about the issues, to argue, to think, uh, think critically, and to think perhaps as, as many people haven't thought before. I would really like to see that. It's, it's going to be, I'm fascinated to see what will happen. I mean, this, it, I, this has been amazingly gratifying to, to, to watch it with all of you and to listen to your response. Um, I suspect that Gus pointed out that there are going to be a, one or two people who are offended. And, um, <laughs> well, you know, it was interesting to me, actually, um, uh, I did look at a review in the Globe and Mail, um, which talked about anyone who believes in the materialist view that somehow the natural world is actually explained by science might like the film, but, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, um, uh, but I, I, uh, I kind of think that I hope that, and, and uh, I think Gus talked about it beautifully, and I can't wait to bring him up. I, I, I know Richard and I were just honored to work with Gus and Luca and the rest of the team, who, in my mind, just produced an amazing film. A piece, a piece of filmmaking, and I, I just want, I know we both want to thank them publicly for, for the remarkable job that they did. The two young guys. The discussion. I really hope that there's a discussion that it provokes a discussion, and, and that was one of the reasons uh, people sometimes ask, well, you know, why why the celebrities? In fact, I think it's okay to say Woody wrote me and said, you know, I think the fact that I'm in the movie reproduces the net seriousness of it. Um, but I think I'm hoping that that people will that that will help with the discussion. That there are obviously some people who know who we are, but. Um, my hope is that it'll reach the people who don't know who Richard and I are, and that this may be the very first time they've heard some of these these questions, and that it will provoke discussion. And I think that that's I think we try to say in the film, and what we try in our in our lives to to, to argue that it's, that we're not proselytizing, that we're just trying to get people to talk about these things and question things. So I certainly hope that'll be the case, and I hope uh, we'll see what the response is. But anyway. Speaking about what happens after the film, what, what's, uh, what's your next project, Richard? Well, I'm slightly abashed to say that I'm writing my autobiography. <laughs> and uh, I, I decided to split it into two volumes. That was to give me a nice feeling that I'd achieved something when I got halfway through. <laughs> and so, um, volume one is actually now finished, and I'm reading the proofs e even now. And that'll be out in, in September. I haven't even started volume two yet, but volume, volume one gets me up to uh, halfway through my life, just when I finished writing my first book, The Selfish Gene, which did, did represent a kind of uh, watershed event. It was a kind of a new departure for me, and so the second half was rather different from the first half, which covers my childhood in Africa, my school days, and, and a rather sort of you know, the typical British boarding public school that you read about in, in, in terrible fiction. <laughs> and, uh, 
somehow managed to survive that and, and, uh, and got, went, went to Oxford and then, um, then became, a, became an academic scientist and then wrote the book that, that rather changed my life. Any other spicy tidbits you want to like? <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> yeah, I get my commission for that. Now, um, uh, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually right now, I'm happy to right now be back and doing some, I'm trying to finish a few scientific papers uh, next week and the next few weeks, which uh, um, for me, uh, it's, I try intensely to be involved in these things, but I, 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 I need to be doing science as well. I, I just kind of feel that if I'm not talking about science, I'm kind of irresponsible, but if I'm not doing science, I, 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 while well, I'm talking about it at this point, uh, I just feel empty. And, and so I'm happy to be doing, going back and doing some of that, but I am, I am um, finishing finish, well, the final touches on, on the proposal for a new book, which I've been urged to do, which I can't talk about. Um, but it will follow up on Universe from Nothing and, and hopefully be, um, um, make some more people upset. Um, but I was going to say, I want to close, because I really want to go to the question here. I know that, I hope Charles isn't too mad, but I'm not going to take as long in the discussion as they asked us to, because I'd like to spend more time listening to your questions. Um, but what do you think, what about us? What do you think we should do next? We continue going on the road or what? Do you think we should continue going on the road? Well, maybe we should talk more about science. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering about that. You know, there's... The, the, some people have said that, and, I, and it's an interesting question. You know, you try and balance it. Maybe we'll get Gus up here and talk about this, too, and, and Luke. Um, I suspect the warm welcome you've given us here today. I really do. Yeah. So 
So when you come into contact with people who are religious, I was strongly persuaded on the belief system. Is it, do you feel that they are, they have impaired neural pathways and is there any research into that? <laughs> so, sorry, I'm not saying. Long question. Okay, is there an impairment to critical thinking when you believe so strongly in something? I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I'm optimistic enough to think that anybody can be persuaded if you persuade hard enough. And uh, that's what I try to do. Um, I, I recognize that there are times when uh, you might as well give up. But then uh, I like to think that when I'm arguing with somebody, uh, say on a stage or uh, on a radio program or something, that I, I may not persuade them, but my efforts to persuade them may persuade other people who are listening in. And there are enormous numbers of people who are not set in their ways, not totally convinced of anything, sitting on the fence, perhaps didn't even realize there was a fence to sit on, um, but now are ready to be persuaded, ready to listen, ready to start thinking for themselves critically. But I want to just add to that, uh, that, you know, there's a real obstacle these people are trying to overcome, and Richard and I have both talked about it, and that is that, that we push these things down the throats of children. Before, well, we don't. I mean, yeah. But, but, and, 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 and both of us in various contexts have called that child abuse and gotten in trouble for doing that. And, but it is. And, and it's very difficult to overcome those things. And, and, and I want to, I'll read a little episode. Um, because, you know, Richard and I have had disagreements early on about how we do these things. But I guess when I really appreciated the consciousness raising that Richard does was when a time, one of the early times, Summarize this a little bit. Um, what was, what do you feel the relationship of Chris Pigeon was to the work you're doing? And, and was that, yeah, okay. Let's, I think I should start. I mean, uh, I was a huge admirer of Chris Pigeon, and um, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and um, it, it's one of the, in my opinion, one of the biggest tragedies of this film is that you know if you were here, almost certainly it would have been the three of them. And um, um, we tried to give as many little nods to him as we could in you know, the book. Lawrence says he's going to read his Bible, and, um, and, and the name at the end. There's other signs of him in the film, but um, uh, he, a huge in inspiration to me. Um, uh, it was because of him, actually, that I met Lawrence. Uh, attended a talk with uh, Christopher and, and met him after the show, and he was exactly how he always said he was. He would carry on the conversation after the talk if there were any questions left, and we ended up hanging out to the uh, wee hours of the morning. Um, in his words, to the point where it's not even really worth going to sleep anymore. And, uh, and he uh, asked me if I knew Lawrence, and at the time I, I didn't. And I think he said, well, I can't make it to his next event, but would you give him a kiss on the cheek for me? Uh, so that, uh, and I, I have. <laughs> a, a huge inspiration. where um, we, we reconvened the, uh, the Four Horsemen, but without Christopher there, uh, it, it was Ion Hersiani. You want to add in that, I mean, Christopher, Christopher is an amazing loss. None of us could replace Christopher. And I remember that very vividly the day he died, I, I, got, I got asked to go on CNN and, and talk about him by some idiot interviewer. And, um, <laughs> and, um, but th this is going to sound pompous, I don't mean it that way. But I, I, it, I remember that day saying to myself, there's a hole, there's a gap. And I'm going to do whatever I can, in my own little way, to, to try and fill that, what I can do with that gap. No one can replace Christopher. But to try and bring some humanity and, uh, and humor but, and, and, and culture, all of the things that he could do better than anyone, um, uh, that legacy deserves to, to be carried on. And so I find it inspiring because it really motivates me personally to try and, 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 and fill a little bit of a gap that, that, that one of those amazing human beings I've ever known. I think he was the most eloquent. 
I think he was the most eloquent speaker I, I ever heard, as well as one of the most erudite. But the questioner asked, as it were, how he sort of fit, fits in, what's the, what's the complementarity. Um, I think he was always a very political animal. And whereas I, my approach to atheism was sort of scientific, I'm passionate about the truth, about the truth about the real world, I think he saw God as a malevolent dictator, oh, yeah. a sort of a big brother from 1984, um, a, 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 a presiding over a sort of celestial North Korea. <laughs> uh, Cosmic Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, in, but let me just say two things about Christopher, which I've said in some places, so you may have seen, but, but they're worth saying. Um, one was that he was the most tolerant person I've ever met of other people. He could be deeply friendly with people um, that had totally different views. And I know, I mean, a friend of both of ours is Francis, uh, what was his last Collins. Name? yeah, 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 Collins, Francis Collins, who's who was the head of the National Institutes of Health and has the nuttiest theology you could ever imagine. Uh, but Francis became Christopher's doctor when he was dying. He was friends at his house uh, with the Supreme Court justices that I would have a hard time holding my dinner down with. Um, <laughs> but he, but he could have conversations with people he completely disagreed with, and I admired that tremendously. But the other thing that it's worth pointing out is he was fascinated by science. And every time he was over there in the wee hours, uh, he talked about science. And, and at his memorial service, I, was, I pointed out, and it's a true story, that, that I, on the last time I was with him before he died, um, there was a knock on the door, and I went up and got him, opened the door for him, and, and it was someone asking me if I, you know, he had a manuscript, and asked if I was Christopher's manager, and I said, no, I'm his personal physicist. <laughs> <laughs> One little uh, aside, a behind-the-scenes story. We, um, we had mostly finished the film, and we were in, in London, and we met with Ian McEwen, and he paid uh, us one of the greatest compliments I think we could have received, which was he watched most of the film and said if Christopher were here, this, he would have absolutely loved it. So that was the best of anyone could say. Okay, the ones far at the back and then we'll come forward. Yes. 
So uh, one of the things that comes up uh, throughout the, the film um, is the subject of ridicule, um, particularly as an approach to dealing with this, this topic. And it, although what's discussed, I'm wondering if you can maybe uh, go a little bit further uh, now on the use of ridicule to communicate your point um, instead of just confrontation, which is something that was discussed on the train. Um, and it's certainly, in my mind, very different than going as far as to pointing the finger and telling somebody that they're flat out wrong and stupid for it. Okay, so the question is, um, could you expand a bit more on the idea of ridicule, ridicule over com uh, confrontation? Relationship to the film religions too, so I thought uh, you probably could speak better about it. One of my favorite moments in the film was when Richard says he was uh, read the book review of uh, by, by uh, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. book review, and that it, it changed. It, you might have insulted your intelligence, but you deserved it. I, I think it just depends on the person and how what kind of uh, what kind of what kind of things they respond to. But um, I don't think you guys. Well, I, I'm very fond of a quote from the British journalist Johan Hari, who said. I respect you as a person too much to respect your ridiculous beliefs. <laughs> you know, and, and I think, um, I know that, that uh, you know, we talk, I talked to Bill Maher recently about the film when I was on the show, and uh, um, I think Religious as a, as a movie in some sense helped inspire a little bit of this. But this is a very different kind of movie. And um, I, th I think that, um, that Humor is incredibly important in, in, in enlightening anything. And, um, and again, you know, to go back to Christopher, I think in some sense it was that charm and humor that broke its way through the, through the distrust and hatred that a lot of people have. And, um, but um, uh, I think that uh, it's really important to point out that we're not just ridiculing religion. We're ridiculing everything that, that doesn't make sense. And, and that includes science. Uh, that's the perfect, I mean, one of the, again, this biggest misconceptions about science and one of the reasons people don't trust evolution, say, or a lot of other things, is I think we have this conspiracy, you get this PhD and you just have a secret handshake. And, and, uh, and the, on the other hand, the thing we want to do when we go into work every day is prove our colleagues wrong. That's how you get ahead. So, um, it's organized ridicule in some senses with science. Is. Have another one at the back, and we'll come back down. Okay. How many atheists in the world? Seven million people in the world. How many atheists are supported by evidence, and how many do you actually believe there are in the fact that they exist? So the question is, how many atheists are there in the world, and how many do you think are really? Oh my God. I mean, yeah, how would just, just there were eras in history when it was very difficult to be an atheist. I mean, you couldn't really be an atheist for more than a couple of centuries ago. It was very difficult to, to do that. Really, before, before Darwin, I would almost say. Um, similarly, there are many places in the world where enormous populations are, where it's, it's almost inconceivable. I mean, the, the idea of being an atheist in, I don't know, Afghanistan, might be quite hard to, I mean, in a, in a country village in Afghanistan or Pakistan, uh, might be a really difficult thing for, some, for a peasant living in a, in a village who, who doesn't have uh, the advantages that we wish they, they could have of, uh, of education. But if you look at places like uh, Western Europe, um, the numbers of atheists are, are really very, very large. And uh, I think the question is quite right to make a distinction between the number of atheists that there really are and the number who are admitted. Uh, I'll elaborate a little bit. I think it's more than just difficult. It's lethal. Uh, you know, there are part of various groups. It's the people are being killed all the time for not just people who say they're atheists, but act open question. And, and that's the tragedy. That's what we have to try and try and fix. And and you know, we were 